All right. Okay, this room is awesome. Um, all right, so we've been doing the cloud now for almost 20 years, right? And serverless, in I guess the most sort of, uh, the beginning of serverless was maybe with the launch of Lambda in 2014. Um, so it's been 10 years since we've been doing serverless. So hopefully we can all agree that we don't build single server applications anymore, right? When we actually think about how we build applications for the cloud and even emulating the cloud locally or bringing things in um, you know, to, the, to sort of local uh, infrastructure and so forth, we do this by essentially you know, building distributed systems that um, compose multiple cloud services together. And in order to do this, we have to stitch all of these different, uh, these different services, we have to stitch them together. And the way that we've done that, or the way that we've sort of come up with, uh, I guess, the way to do that, um, is by building patterns, right? I am a huge fan of patterns. It's something that I'm quite passionate about. We have a lot of software patterns, but as the cloud has evolved, as serverless has evolved, we've really now taken to this idea of building patterns that allow us to build pretty spectacular things. So before we go any further, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Dave gave uh, a brilliant introduction. I appreciate that. I appreciate that you think I'm a leader in the serverless um, community. I'm just so grateful to be a part of it um, and all of the amazing people that are there. Um, but as, as Dave mentioned, I am the founder of a startup called Amped, um, where we're doing hopefully some interesting things. I've been doing cloud consulting for a very, very, very long time. Um, I'm 25 plus years in tech. I know that is because every day I wake up and something different hurts. Um, I started using AWS way back in 2009, uh, 2009 so it's been 15, 15 years or so. And then Lambda, right after it went GA, I discovered it. Um, changed my life, changed the way I thought about um, building applications. I blog at my, uh, at my website, jeremydaily.com. I have a bunch of OSS projects that I have let Many of them fall terribly out of date, but again, community is an amazing thing because I have some great people that help out with, uh, with those projects. Um, and then the newsletter. Oh, by the way, I just started doing this weekly news quiz. It's seven questions about what's kind of happening in the cloud news space. It's kind of fun, so check that out. Um, and then, uh, as, as uh, Dave mentioned, the, the Serverless Chats podcast. It's been on a bit of a hiatus, but there's a hundred and some odd episodes that are still highly relevant today. And then I am an AWS Serverless Hero, which is an absolute um, amazing program to be in, uh, and I really appreciate AWS for everything they do there. All right, so speaking about patterns, so six years ago, almost six years ago, I think it was, I published this blog post called Serverless Microservice Patterns for AWS. And what I did is I had been working on serverless at that point for a couple of years, uh, had started writing a bunch of blog posts, had started using it in, in a lot of things, started using it in production, and I kind of came up with like these 19 patterns. Now, these patterns weren't mine. I didn't come up with them on my own. Some of them I had been using. Some of them were previous patterns that existed in other, you know, other sort of software patterns or distributed system patterns. But what was interesting about this was I published this post mostly to validate my own thinking, right? Which is something I encourage everybody to do. So put something out there, even if you don't know if it's right, because then you get other people to either say, oh, I'm doing it that way as well, or, oh, that's not quite right, and it'll just help you sort of progress. And again, building beyond um, you know, boundaries here, like you, you have to get outside of your comfort zone in order to start understanding you know, whether your thinking is right or your thinking is wrong. So I published this, and there was 19 patterns, and I think they were pretty straightforward, and, I, and people, I got a lot of good feedback on this post. A few years later, a uh, native son of Norn Iron, uh, Matt Coulter, um, created the CDK Patterns site, and what was really interesting about this, and this was part of a, a, a thing they were doing at Liberty, what was really nice about this was he took a lot of the patterns, some of the ones that I had documented, other ones that other people had documented, and he put them into CDK constructs. And if you're not familiar with CDK constructs, essentially it's a way in which you can kind of grab the pattern off the shelf and you just say, use this construct and it deploys it for you. Um, and it's a brilliant way to do it. Um, so this was a, a sort of an evolution of patterns to say, well, what if we codify these patterns some way? Now, I don't remember how many patterns he had, maybe 20, 25, something like that he added to it. But essentially what eventually came along was the AWS serverless DA team put together this uh, serverless patterns collection site. And this 
is the ultimate collection to go check out. There's so many blog posts, and, and Lee Gilmore has a, a patterns library and some of these other things. But this is absolutely best place to go to check out all the patterns. The problem is, is that there's 817 templates, OK? And that maybe represents 250 patterns. They, they do it in different forms. So they have you know, Pulumi and Serverless Framework and Terraform and some of these other things, which is great. But if you're looking for a pattern, this is how I look at that, right? I sort of am like, uh, that's, that's a lot, right? And how am I supposed to know how to go through all those? So <laughs> the site is very, very good. It's well organized. I appreciate AWS for this because these need to be documented. And you'll see that most of these patterns are relatively, relatively simple, right? It's only a few services they stitch together. So let's take a look at some of these patterns, and we'll talk about them a little bit more uh, in depth. So this is one of my favorite patterns, right? API Gateway to Lambda to DynamoDB. Um, and essentially, I wrote about this pattern back in 2018, and I called this the simple web service. And the reason why I called this simple web service is it's pretty simple, right? API Gateway uh, handles an HTTP request, makes a call to Lambda that does some processing, calls Dynamo, sends the information back. The problem with a lot of these patterns, not so much a problem, but the thing with a lot of these patterns is they often end up as part of a much larger pattern, OK? And so that little simple web service, I don't know if I can point here, that's no, not going to work. That little simple web service is embedded you know, behind a CloudFront distribution with an S3 bucket, multiple Lambda functions, you know, maybe a direct uh, integration with SQS. Maybe it's got some DynamoDB streams that do some processing that send it to uh, Elastic, I'm sorry, that send it to uh, EventBridge, which then have a whole bunch of different you know, microservices that it coordinates with and some step functions and things like that. And so what this ultimately does is it adds a ton of complexity, all right? And complexity in and of itself is not a bad thing, right? Things need to be complex. The cloud is complex. It will always be complex. Um, it'll get more complex. But the services, the primitives, things like DynamoDB, yeah, that's complex in and of itself, but it's nice because it sort of encapsulates all that functionality for you. And API Gateway, it has a lot of complicated configurations, but for the most part, the service itself is really, really good and it's solid. Where we see a lot of the complexity is that when you start taking these multi-service applications, it's the cross-service complexity that becomes tough. It's the pipes between you know, DynamoDB and SQS, or DynamoDB and EventBridge and these other services. That's when it starts to become a little bit more complex. And the reason is because you have to think about permissions. Every service has to talk to another service and has to be able to negotiate those permissions between them using IAM. You have to think about timeouts, OK? So how long can this service communicate with this service before that service times out and something else happens? You have to think about state management. How do I get state from this service to that service, or if that process is after the fact and it's asynchronous, where does that state come from? You have to think about network latency. Everybody forgets when we do, um, when we do distributed systems, there is a network between those different services that fails all the time. Uh, failovers and retries, speaking of that, like what happens when this service doesn't actually communicate? How do you retry that? Where is that built in? Testability has become more and more difficult, right? Now, where do, you t where do we test event bridge, uh, event bridge pipes and all these other things or step functions? There's ways to do these in isolation, but as part of a larger application, it's a little bit tough. And then observability. This is, a, this is a big thing. There's 8 million observability companies now, three good ones. I won't tell you which ones they are. But there's, uh, there's a lot of really, really great things that are happening in observability because it is so tough to do distributed tracing and do some of these other things. We were just having a debate last night about OTEL and X-ray and what's the right thing to use and so forth. Now, if you think that's complicated and you're like, yeah, but those are just things. Those are part of building applications. Like, you just need to learn those things, and that's fine. That's part of the cloud. I just saw this the other day, and it kind of blew my mind. So this is the user guide for IAM, right? Which, to me, is one of the most complex services. You need a PhD for this. So I looked this up. This is over 3,000 pages just for the IAM. OK, sorry, it's down here behind the lectern. If you can't see it. 3,000 pages. That is twice as long as War and Peace and half as interesting. OK, so one of the things about all of those interdependent services and all the things we have to know about those services is the fact that a lot of the responsibility for those services 
now fall on the developer. So I don't even know what it means to be a developer anymore because, again, we're doing architecture, we're doing testing, we're doing observability, we're doing all these other things. Um, and so it sort of brings me to this point of serverless developer responsibility. I'm going to say serverless developer because I feel like a serverless developer is a different breed of developer, right? This is somebody who is end-to-end. -end. We're dealing with a lot of different things. So what are the responsibilities that we have? So business logic, everybody, everybody knows business logic. Right? We all write business logic no matter what kind of developer you are. But if you're a serverless developer, you also have to know about infrastructure and cloud architecture, and you have to write those things as well. You have to do the build and deployment pipelines, right? So it's no longer, I wrote some code here, Mr. Ops person or Mrs. Ops person, go ahead, I'm gonna give that to you and you go ahead and, and publish that to the cloud for me. I have to be responsible for that. Again, monitoring and observability, that is now a responsibility that you as a serverless developer have, okay? You have to build observability and monitoring into the applications that you design. And then security and compliance. This used to be my last point. I use this slide quite a bit. This used to be my last point, and I was like, yeah, because nobody thinks about security and compliance, right? Well, then reInvent happens, and this guy goes ahead and publishes the frugal architect. So now he wants all of us serverless developers to be thinking about not just performance, but cost optimization, okay? So let's look at a pattern and talk about cost and performance, and then we'll, we'll get back to sort of the main, the main bit here. All right, so this is another favorite pattern of mine. Does anybody know what this pattern is called? You can swap out SQS with DynamoDB if you want to. Anybody know what the name of this is? Anybody? Okay. This is called the storage first pattern. And the idea behind this pattern is simple. You make a request, and rather than you writing really bad, janky code that's probably going to fail at some point and lose a whole bunch of events, you just create a direct connection into SQS or DynamoDB. You save that information. You create that durability so that event is now saved. Now I can go ahead and maybe attach a Lambda function here, and I can pull off of this stream when I want to. If my code fails, I fail my function. It returns to the SQS queue. I can process it again. I can use DynamoDB streams, same thing. All right, so this pattern is great, works amazing. So let's talk about a different aspect of patterns, though, the actual throughput of these patterns. So if there is one request per second made to this, which is still 2.5 million requests per month, so that's still a fair amount of traffic. Now, again, this is, they say it's evenly spaced, doesn't really matter. Point is, is that API Gateway is going to cost you maybe $2 per month, right? So 2.5 million requests, something like that. This, this would be HTTP APIs, by the way, not uh, REST APIs, if you weren't able to tell the difference between those two, because um, it's really easy. Um, so SQS would be about a dollar a month, dollar thirty a month, something like that. Uh, and sorry, I'm not using pounds. I have to use, um, I have to use dollars, because it's the only thing I understand. Um, and then Lambda will cost you maybe $5 a month um, to process that. Now, that's if you're not using any batching, but if it's one request per second, you know, maybe you, you wouldn't use batching if you want the throughput to be there. OK. What if it was 1,000 requests per second? Well, suddenly, API Gateway goes up to $2,332 a month, and that's not including bandwidth. Add another $4,000 or something like that for bandwidth. SQS gets to $1,300 a month, and Lambda, if you start doing batches of 10, which is the maximum you can do with SQS, you're somewhere around $477 per month. OK, so this gets expensive really, really fast. Now, the other thing is, is if you say, well, 1,000 requests per second, like that's a lot. Well, it's 2.5 billion requests per month, which is about 80 million requests per day, which honestly, if you're built like a Next.js app and it has to make 30 requests on every page load, you, you could get there pretty fast, right? All right. So what if we, though, took SQS and we swapped that out with Kinesis? Well, at our one request per second, our API gateway and our Lambda function, those are going to cost you know, pretty much the same. But now Kinesis, just to provision a shard and have that running all the time, it's a provision service, not an uh, on-demand. Well, they call it on-demand, but who knows? Um, it, it's, serverless is a weird word in, 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 uh, in AWS and many other services now in terms of what it actually means. But that's going to cost you $11 a month to provision that constantly. Okay. All right, now, what if we're at 1,000 requests per second? So not much we can do about API Gateway if we're going to leave that in the mix. But now Kinesis only costs us $64 a month as opposed to $1,300 a month for SQS, right? Big cost difference there. And then with Lambda, because we can actually do batches, I think up to 10,000 with Kinesis, even if we just did batches of 100, right, we cut our, cut our cost by, you know, 
what, 90% or whatever that is, right? So $48 a month, something like that. Now, we could switch API Gateway with ECS backed by Fargate. We can have this debate as to whether or not that's serverless or not. I used to be in the serverless containers. That sounds crazy, but now I'm kind of like, we need these. So I'm back on this. And this could cost you, it depends, I mean, however you configure it, but maybe $600 a month. But again, tremendous amount of savings if you were to implement this pattern with a fairly good velocity. And of course, you know, if it's 500 requests per second or bursts or things like that, you know, this is just a nice pattern to have. So um, if we wipe out the request per seconds, though, so even if it's just sitting there, I just provisioned this. I'm not even using it. It's just sitting on a shelf somewhere, but I provisioned it. I'm still at like $75 a month to have this pattern now. So my whole serverless scale to zero thing is gone, and now I'm paying $75 a month to just have it sit there. Now, I will make this argument over and over and over again, and I'll say this to AWS. I know you get some fine AWS people back there and in the crowd as well. I have no problem paying for production. When I have a workload that is provisioned and is getting traffic, I have no problem paying for that. But what about all my developers, right? So am I gonna go ahead and deploy $75 a month for one pattern, by the way, one tiny bit of a pattern. We saw that other pattern that had all that other stuff going on. Am I gonna deploy that for every developer that I have? I mean, in reality, what I would love to be able to do is say, I want that in production, but all of my developers, I want them using that free version, right? I want them using that, that simpler version of it there. All right, so this is another one of those responsibilities that falls back on us as developers, and that's the fact that we have to make choices, right? And oftentimes, there aren't very many good choices. You just have to make the best choice at the time. So I created this slide, or this uh, meme, I don't know, whatever you wanna call it, quite a while ago, but the idea here is that you know, this is a very popular article that you see all the time or blog posts. It's like, should I use Kinesis? Should I use SQS? Should I use EventBridge? Should I use SNS? Um, that can be a fairly difficult choice sometimes depending on what you're doing. But what we just saw is it's not even what is the right tool, right? Whether I should use maybe FIFO queues versus Kinesis, it's how much throughput, right? What, what is the traffic gonna be? When does that matter? Like, how does that affect it? And so, it's not just about what we choose anymore. I've come to realize that it's actually about when we have to make that choice as developers, okay? And when do we make that choice? We make that choice very, very early on, before we know how much memory we need, before we know how much throughput we're likely to get, before we know what the performance implications are going to be, before we know maybe even, you know, we have to go back and say, oh, by the way, this is gonna cost X amount of dollars, right? So we, we don't necessarily know these things, but we have to go ahead and build and design from experience, and we have to build and design these things very early on, and the way that we've done this is infrastructure as code. That's when we have to make that decision. When we write everything down, when we codify it and say, I'm gonna use a Lambda function, I'm gonna use that API gateway, I'm gonna use SQS, I'm gonna use batches of 10, I'm gonna do all this stuff. That's, that's when we have to make that choice. Now, infrastructure as code is great. It's so much better than click ops. If you're not doing infrastructure as code and you're in the, you know, you're, you're in the console clicking around, figure out infrastructure as code, okay? Because you need to have the ability to have those repeatable deployments, they need to be deterministic, we need those things to happen. But infrastructure as code, as good as it is, as useful as it is, it's not perfect. And it actually creates a lot of issues, especially when it comes to making those choices. So a couple of things about infrastructure as code that tend to bother me. One is the fact that you duplicate a lot of what you're doing in your application code that has to get duplicated into your infrastructure as code. So think about doing API, like an API gateway. You define an API route, but then in your code, you also then use some sort of framework that says, oh, if this is the path, then I'm going to do this there. So you're duplicating a lot of things, which can become a little bit frustrating. The other thing is, is that again, infrastructure's code is very declarative. So even if you're using CDK or Pulumi and you're like, oh yeah, but it's dynamic, because I write, it doesn't matter. The point is, is it eventually gets compiled down or gets turned into a, uh, a process for, for being a very declarative state of your infrastructure, and that is kind of at odds when you think about how dynamic these applications are, especially when it comes to throughput, you know, and the runtime behavior of an application. The other thing is, is that you 
ultimately are creating control plane specific instructions. You're saying, I need Kinesis, I need SQS, I need EventBridge, whatever it is. And what that results in is very, very static architectures. Architectures that get created on the developer side and then get executed or you know, get actually deployed then to the cloud. Um, and then the other thing that, again, I've been talking about this for a very long time, this idea of configuration over code. I love this. Configuration over code is an absolutely amazing thing that I'm so glad we did. And the reason is, and, and by the way, configuration over code is this idea that rather than you writing application code to do something, you codify some of this business logic within your infrastructure as code, okay? So this could be something like, you know, what happens if the uh, Lambda function times out? What happens if uh, the Lambda function doesn't get invoked? There's a bunch of things that you can't write defensive code for. So you can't, if, if your Lambda function never fires, if you make a request, you know, an asynchronous request, and that Lambda function never fires, you can't write code that says, hey, that Lambda function never fired. You won't know that. Only the cloud knows that, and you have to configure that and write that and embed that into your infrastructure as code. So what this does is this creates a bifurcation of business logic. So think about event bridge pipes. Think about direct integrations with, um, uh, with API gateway. Think about step functions. You're taking a lot of business logic and you're actually codifying that into infrastructure as code, oftentimes then passing context into code that you write, maybe in a Lambda function or something like that. Uh, and the best explanation I heard for this was, this is like um, writing uh, stored procedures in SQL. Right? So if you've ever written a stored procedure in SQL, then you're old enough to get most of my jokes. Um, but the, the problem with stored procedures is somebody writes this thing and it seems brilliant, right? Because you're like, oh, I, I, you know, this is all, it does everything. All I have to do is make this one function call in my SQL request and it will come back and give us everything that we need until somebody changes a schema and you go back three, mo three months ago or five months ago or five years ago and you say, I have no idea what this does. I actually used to write, uh, does anybody use Ramda? Does anybody use Ramda as like functional programming code for JavaScript? It seemed so amazing and I felt so superior to everyone when I wrote things in Ramda. And then I would go back like two weeks later and say, I have no idea what that does because it's just composing and composing and composing. Um, and then finally, the other thing that it does is you write code for Lambda, right? You write code for Fargate or for a containerized system. You have to write code specifically for the infrastructure you're using. You have to say, I'm communicating with SQS or I'm communicating with EventBridge. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing except that now if I want to change a piece of my architecture, I have to change my application code too, right? So it's not just this sort of um, agnostic thing that it's running on, but it gets very, very tightly coupled. Um, okay. so. With all that stuff that I said to you, again, don't stop building a serverless because it's still absolutely amazing. But I'd love to tell the story and say I was hanging a picture. This is one of those jokes you might not get. I was hanging a picture. I slipped, hit my head in the toilet, and then I came up with this. Anybody get this? OK. I wish I could tell you that story. But what we actually did was me and a few other people we spent quite a bit of time. I've been doing these patterns for a long time now. And again, six years in serverless feels like I don't know, 100 years, it seems, because things go by so fast. But I started thinking to myself, I'm like, what is a better way to do these patterns? Why do we have to have patterns be so static? Why is it that we have to make all these decisions up front? There are so many other things that are adaptable. We have auto scaling. We have all these really great things that we can do. And that's when it sort of came to us, this notion of productized patterns. Um, and the idea behind a productized pattern, we'll get into it a little bit, but if you think about that static architecture piece. The way that we build architectures now, or the way that we build applications now, is we codify that, we, we sketch it out, we give all those control plane instructions, and then we hand that, that sort of blueprint over to the cloud. But what if they weren't static? What if they were adaptable? What if we could take the all of that you know, sort of detailed configuration and say, well, what if some of that can be dynamically processed in the runtime or on the cloud, and that we don't have to think about, we don't have to make all those choices. And that's essentially what we're trying to do or what I think pro uh, productized patterns will do. So let's go back to this example. I'll, I'll walk you through a few things. Um, this is that example we used before with storage first. So what if this was running in your developer sandbox or wherever it is? Maybe you put it into, you put it into your uh, in production, and then you start to see those requests go up. 
Well, what if the pattern itself was able to provision a kinesis stream and then hot swap that kinesis stream out for the SQSQ? Now, what this would do, the pattern, this would be built in. So the pattern would say, oh, you're going to use Kinesis now, so now I need to start routing those requests into Kinesis. But the Lambda function can still be smart enough to drain that SQSQ, right? And then what if you say, oh, well, I need to go back, or there's some reason. But the point here is that that would be codified into the pattern itself, all right? So it would be able, it would be able to handle that type of stuff. And if we thought of a, maybe a simpler pattern, something like CloudFront to Lambda uh, function URLs. So Lambda function URLs are great. This is an absolutely amazing pattern because this enables you to do actual streaming from Lambda URLs, but still put most of them, uh, you know, put, have a, a common domain so you don't have to go directly to the Lambda furl. So you can set this up, and then you get 15 minutes of potential HTTP streaming. Um, very, very good pattern. But if we're thinking about costs, once you get over about 15 requests per second or so, Lambda gets kind of expensive. So what if we were able to provision an app runner cluster behind the scenes and hot swap that? Now, this pattern's more complex to do that because the code that you would normally deploy to your Lambda function is going to look different than the code that you deploy to your app runner function or your app runner cluster or containers, I guess. So you would have to have a much more sort of intimate relationship with the code uh, as opposed to packaging that on the user side or on the developer side, that code has to be more flexible so that it can be redeployed and reconfigured automatically for you to deploy to that. And now another pattern that I absolutely love is this idea of saying, look, if I've got a CloudFront distribution, I love sharing the same URL. So if I created a static assets bucket, maybe I have an API gateway for some configuration around Maybe there's some login or some permissions I got Cognito connected to or whatever. Maybe I have some streaming that I want to be able to do um, using a, a Lambda function. So if I want to do this now, I mean, I could basically say, okay, well, all my default routes maybe go to this, and then maybe I can code in a route that goes to the Lambda furl, and then anything that's slash static, okay, route it into that static assets bucket. But why do we even have to make those trade-offs? Why can't we do something like put a Lambda at Edge function here and say, well, if it's a static asset, let's map it directly to static. So I can go to slash you know, myjs.js or whatever it is, or I can do slash users, and that's all going to work for me. But the way in order to do this and to do this efficiently is I need to have some sort of a manifest that I can dynamically pull into my Lambda at Edge function. Well, the only way we can do this is if the pattern also understands your code base, whether it's by convention or it's by configuration, but it knows which files are static, it knows which, need, which routes are dynamic, and so forth. So it does need to know a little bit more um, about how it works. But if, if it knows that, then a request comes in and I can say, okay, this is a static asset route to there. This is, a, you know, this is a, one of my ones that I want to go to, a, a route that goes to API Gateway. This is a streaming function or WebSocket or whatever it is I want this to go to here. So again, it's a, this is the future, I think. This is, again, I didn't hit my head on a toilet, but I still think this is a fut the future because it's so difficult right now to keep all of this stuff straight. And I'll go through a couple of these ideas of, of why I think productized patterns are this future that we're talking about. So first of all, the idea behind them is that they would be standardized. So we would take all those best practice approaches, same thing that Matt Coulter did with the CDK constructs or the CDK patterns, um, uh, the things that they've done with the, with the other, uh, with the, the patterns library at Service Land. But the difference is, is that we're codifying this so that every time somebody deploys this, it's always using the current best practices. What we see a lot happen is people will download a pattern and then the pattern changes or there's some updates to the pattern and people don't implement those or they build them themselves. The other thing, and this is a common complaint, like, well, yeah, but how do I change the batch size or some of these other things? What are some of the decisions I want to make? I mean, productized patterns are just a pattern. They can still be configured, and they can be configured, you know, based off, again, code, convention, other things. It can be buried in the code and be part of configuration file. How you do it doesn't necessarily matter, but the point is you do want them to be configurable. You also want them to be composable, right? So we saw that you know, one little function or one little pattern is going to be part of a much larger pattern. That's something that you should be able to do with productized patterns as well, compose them to form a much more complex pattern, and again, have them understand one another so that they can do that. 
Um, they're reusable, so again, the, the hope here would be that you build a productized pattern, that becomes the standard pattern that everybody uses. You reuse that across your organization, you reuse that um, you know, across different projects, maybe, maybe they're public and, and they can be reused in multiple places. And I think one of the, the most interesting things about them is they're evolvable. So think about, you have a thousand people using a productized pattern, if somebody finds an edge case of that pattern, if that edge case is fixed there, we're now using, we're now telling to use the productized pattern, which runs on the runtime, quote unquote, server side, as opposed to the development side, so you don't have to go ahead and update your code. Like, this would just take advantage of whatever new features there were, whatever new capabilities there were, right, and give you that guarantee without you actually having to update any of your application code or any of your IEC. And then finally, this is something that I also think is the future, is this idea of self-provisioning um, runtimes. And that's the idea to say that you give the actual pattern or the runtime the ability to control the infrastructure. Um, this is what gives you determinism, right? This gives you that deterministic deploy that even though it can be flexible in what it can do, you're codifying very specific things into how the pattern can mutate, um, and those are all part of the pattern itself. So it's not like you have you know, generative AI that's coming up with wild ideas. Um, this would always be the same. Okay, this is really different. I, I think this is the future. This doesn't necessarily exist yet. I don't know anybody else who's necessarily doing something like that. This is something we're working on at Amped. I'm not trying to sell you. Go to getamped.com if you want to see what we're doing. Um, but here's the biggest thing. I get that we all fear change. And if you're new to serverless, how many people have been doing serverless for like less than a year? Less than a year. Okay, what about like, who, who are like my three, four, five year veterans out there? Right, okay. So. We've learned to do things a specific way. I was going to use the quote, you know, the, the, the most dangerous saying in the, what was it, most dangerous saying is that we've always done things this way or something like that, right? Um, that, is a, that, that is a real concern of people because things change so fast. And I know that Gen AI is coming, um, or has, I guess, is here. Um, and, you know, people worry about, is it going to build all my apps for me? Is it going to do these different things? We can have this conversation in the hallway if we want to, but I do think that what we need to do as a serverless community is move beyond the hype, right? Figure out what are the things that we're best at. Where do we add the most value? Where can we make the best decisions? Um, and then how do, we, how do we amplify that decision process or how do we amplify that process and get rid of a lot of that toil? So the idea of productized patterns, in my opinion, is to say, these patterns exist. Somebody has already figured out the, the best practices. There's an amazing community. There's AWS solution architects and so forth. We've already figured out what is the best way to accomplish X use case. Yeah, there needs to be some variability, okay? But don't go and spend a whole bunch of time reinventing the wheel, right? Use those patterns, um, and then hopefully we can productize those patterns so that we don't choose the wrong pattern and then have to go back and you know, redeploy you know, six uh, cloud, front, uh, cloud formation changes in order to swap things around. But anyways, that's where I, I think we need to focus on, is let's focus on our strengths, what we as humans, as thinkers, as builders, what we add to the table, get rid of the toil, maybe it's you know, Gen AI that helps us with that, um, I don't know, but, um, but, that's, but I think that's the direction that uh, we're headed with serverless. So hopefully this was of some use to you, um, and, uh, but if you'd like, uh, you know, check out the, my blog and the newsletter and uh, some of these other things here and check out Get Amped, but other than that, I was gonna say, uh, at us, nigh, right? I was going to say that at the end, but Dave stole it from me. So anyways, thank you very much.